Namaste and good afternoon, everyone. I, Ritika Gupta, Assistant Director at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabha Vebam Niti, Anusandhan Sansthan, Nahi Delhi, extend my heartiest welcome to this IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we are here for a special lecture on the law in my kitchen, questions about gender, agency, and the state by Dr. Madhvi Menon. I would now like to welcome our moderator for today, Dr. Simi Mehta, who is CEO at IMPRI, to introduce the ma'am and chair further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ritika. And greetings to everyone uh, on this very important uh, lecture. Uh, on behalf of Gender Impact Studies Center at IMPRI, I extend my warm welcome to all of you uh, to hashtag web policy talk, IMPRI special lecture by Dr. Madhvi Menon. Um, it is my privilege to introduce to you the chair for the session, Professor Rukmini Bhaya Nair, uh, who is Professor of Linguistics and English Emerita at uh, IIT Delhi. Uh, she has received her PhD from University of Cambridge and has since taught at universities ranging from Singapore to Stanford. She was awarded a second honorary doctorate by the University of Antwerp for her contributions to narrative theory. Uh, Professor Nair has contributed, has authored 10 books and over 200 uh, papers and articles. Some of her books include Lying on the Post-Colonial Couch, Narrative Gravity, Conversation, Cognition, Culture and Poetry in a Time of Terror, which was published by Oxford University Press and has also written a wide ranging reference volume co-edited with Peter D'Souza titled Keywords for India, a conceptual lexicon for the 20th century, published by Bloomsbury Academic. Uh, in addition, Professor Nair has also published three volumes of poetry with Penguin. Uh, the Oxford Companion to Modern Poetry 2014 actually uh, says, which also lists um, reputed and eminent uh, iconic names like T.S. Eliot and Pablo Neruda. Uh, it says that her work that is uh, widely admired by other poets and critics for its postmodern approach to lyrical meaning and feminine identity. And among other positions that uh, Madam has held, she has been the head of department, humanities and social sciences at IIT Delhi, crash fellow at Cambridge University, senior postdoctoral fellow at Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, professor, professorial fellow at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, Tagore fellow at Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, etc. Uh, so, um, Professor uh, Nair has also held major grants from the Department of Science and Technology, Indian Council of Cultural Relations, etc. Professor Nair frequently writes on many social issues for national newspapers and TV channels, and her writings, both creative and critical, have been included on the syllabi of uh, uh, reputed universities like Chicago University, Harvard, Kent, Toron Toronto, etc. So grateful to you, ma'am, that you have joined us this evening as the chair for this very important lecture. Uh, it is my honor to introduce to you our speaker for the day, Professor Madhvi Menon. Uh, professor Madhvi Menon is a professor of English at Ashoka University, and she's also the director of the Center for the Study Studies in Gender and Sexuality at Ashoka University, which is the first of its kind in India. Uh, previously, she was a professor of English at American University, George Washington University, and before that, Ithaca College uh, in Ithaca, New York. Professor Menon is a queer theorist and has written extensively on the subjects of desire, identity, and theory. Uh, Professor Menon has completed her PhD from Tufts University and uh, a BA and an MA degree first class uh, from St. Stephen's College. Some of her uh, eminent publications include A History of Desire in India, uh, published by Speaking Tiger 2018, Indifference to Difference Towards Queer Universalism, published by University of Minnesota Press uh, 2015, Shakespeare, a queer companion to the uh, complete works of Shakespeare, published by Duke University Press, Unhistorical Shakespeare, Queer Theory in Shakespearean Literature and Film, Wanton Woods, Words, Rhetoric and Sexuality in uh, English Renaissance Drama. Uh, her current book project is titled The Law of Desire, which is forthcoming this year. Uh, congratulations, ma'am. It is being published by Speaking Tiger. Uh, 
Professor Menon's research interests include, among other things, queer theory, Renaissance literature, and Shakespeare. Broadly, Professor Menon works with the questions of sexuality, desire, gender, politics, identity. We are so privileged, ma'am, to have you amidst us. Professor Menon, thank you so much. We also have with us Ms. Akanksha Agrahari, Ms. Prerna Sen Gupta, and Ms. Riddhi Bang from the Language Rights blog, and Dr. Usha Mudiganti, who is an assistant professor at the School of Liberal Studies at Ambedkar University as discussants. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us this evening. We are so, so excited to be uh, able to hear uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Madhvi Menon this evening. I invite Professor Menon to deliver her welcome remarks and invite Professor Menon to deliver her lecture. Thank you so much. Over to you, Professor Nair. Right, uh, thank you very much for that extensive and informative introduction, except, um, you know, in my case, I would really like to thank you for mentioning my poetry because it tends to be totally marginalized in any academic discussion. So, and I, I'm very um, uh, pleased to be here. It's a great pleasure to chair this talk by Madhavi. And I want to thank you and everybody at IMPRI for the opportunity. I also very much look forward to the chance to listen to the panelists, the students, Usha, and the questions from the audience and Madhavi's responses. And since we are all quite eager to, to kind of listen to the speakers. I don't want to spend too much time uh, on introductory remarks. However, I do want to thank Madhvi for choosing a title for her talk, which at the outset is, uh, you know, is likely to arouse passion, even among the most passive amongst us, because I think that, you know, look at the title, The Law in My Kitchen, what is it? Questions about gender, agency, and the state. Now I'm a linguist, and the, first, the minute I saw this title, a kind of intersectionality invaded my mind because I saw law connecting with state and uh, the kitchen connecting with gender. And I got a beautiful cross with uh, a node in the middle, which was to do with agency. And I thought, what a brilliant way to draw in a very large interdisciplinary audience. And of course, many other dichotomies immediately spring up once you've created such an imaginative, or Madhavi has created such an imaginative matrix for us, uh, for things Things like active, passive, patriarch, pat no, uh, patronized, empirical, con conceptual, prescriptive, and descriptive grammars, mind, body, and everything else, all generated by that intersectionality. So I would like. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. And of course, it does become the business of a theorist such as Madhvi once we have all these. Uh, and uh, these dichotomies to show us how porous the boundaries between them are and to dissect them. So the ambiguity of, uh, of dichotomy is one of the things that we get from literary scholars uh, looking at the nuances which we don't get from others. So that's another aspect that I'm looking forward to in her talk, how she empirically grounds this uh, this talk in the law at Shabarimala and in the film that she's just about to show and chooses her site as Kerala. So we have all these dichotomies, but instead, uh, you know, and how I'm, I'm waiting to see uh, how Madhvi will negotiate or lead us through this labyrinth of um, concepts. But let me just say before I end that um, when I heard the title of your talk and um, saw a kind of abstract uh, that, um, you know, it called to my mind a phrase uh, by a student of René Descartes. And that uh, uh, Descartes, as everybody here knows, was the founder 
of the distinction between the mind and the body, the law and gender, as you know, as you know, because he postulated the distinction between res cogitans, the substance of the mind, and res extensa, which was the body. And all theorists ever since have talked in um, the Cartesian terms, including Noam Chomsky in linguistics, who calls his linguistics Cartesian linguistics. But what I wanted to emphasize was this phrase by the student of Descartes, and that phrase was, uh, the mind has no sex. Let me repeat, the mind has no sex. Now, I think this question of whether the mind has a sex, whether it has multiple sexes or no sexes at all, is a uh, is, a, uh, is something which is a difficult, which remains a difficult question to this day. And Descartes himself was puzzled by it because he says, okay, there's the substance of the mind, concepts, the law, there's the substance of the body, the kitchen, the, the tactile nature of the sensory uh, apparatus, which we all have. But in between, he said, are the passions things like fear and desire and love, where do we put the passions? Do we put them in the mind or in the body? And I think that that entanglement of desire with law is what Madhavi is going to explore today. And it remains, to my mind, one of the serious critical questions of the day. So as I said, I'm looking forward to what Carolites would call a sadhya, a feast of food for thought. And she has kitchen in her title. So we must hold her to this promise of a feast. And I want to thank everybody, our audience, our discussants, for and Impri for planning this evening. Thanks again and over to you, Madhvi. Madhvi? Thanks very much for that generous introduction and the generous introduction to the concepts of uh, what I would like to discuss today. Frankly, I would much rather listen to you, uh, Rukmini, talk about this than, than to anything that I have to say. And thank you to Simi and to Arjun, of course, for uh, having invited me. Um, I'd just like to say at the outset, before we show the, the trailer for the film, uh, that this is not going to be uh, that this is going to be neither a lecture nor really a talk. It's just going to be. I'd like to introduce some ideas or some questions I've been grappling with, um, and then I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with all of you, uh, both on the screen in front of me and and people in the audience who are out there in in space somewhere. Yes. Um, and I uh, and uh, Rukmini was very kind about about my title. Uh, but really, it's because of the title of the film that I'm about to speak um, about, which is called The Great Indian Kitchen. And whenever you ask anyone, have you seen The Great Indian Kitchen? They're likely to say, no, no, I don't watch cooking shows. Uh, but this is not a cooking show. Um, and I'd like to begin on uh, Rukmini and Arjun and Simi's advice to actually begin with the trailer of the film. Uh, so people have some sense uh, about it if you haven't seen it. And then I'll start talking for a few minutes. Yes, Aritika, please start. In the number Kudumbata Patiana Brain, family is a universal group, family based on marriage. Would you put it in the Mulamuli? The Samsarikan does not know that. Nandanili, <laughs> Best. 
ചോദിക്കും പണ്ട് എനിക്ക് ഹോട്ടലിൽ തിന്നുന്നത് ഇത്ര പറ്റൂല ഇത് തറവാട്ട് പറഞ്ഞ പെണ്ണുങ്ങൾക്ക് പറ്റിയ പണി ആണോ ഓള് ചെയ്തത് അല്ലെങ്കിൽ അന്നോടെല്ലാം പറഞ്ഞിട്ടില്ല അന്നെ കൂട്ടി കൂട്ടിക്കൊണ്ടു വന്നു എന്നോട് ആരും ഒന്നും പറഞ്ഞിട്ടില്ല ഇത് അറിഞ്ഞോണ്ടാ അമ്മ എന്താ ഞാൻ പറയുന്നത് മനസ്സിലാക്കാത്ത അയ്യോ Thank you so much, Ritika. It's a surprising trailer, actually. I hadn't seen the trailer before because it um, leaves out many, many important parts of it. But maybe that's how good trailers are made. They sort of don't tell you um, most of what's going on. Okay, so as I said, I'll just sort of speak for a few minutes, um, introduce some ideas I have, uh, maybe for about 20 minutes, and then look forward to having a conversation with everyone. Um, and as uh, both uh, Simi and Rukmini said, the title of my... Um, Conversation today is the law in my kitchen, questions about gender and the state. And really, I, I mean the state to be synonymous with the law here, but didn't want to use the word law twice in the title. So uh, I pretty much mean the law when I'm talking about the state. And I, am, um, I have just finished, as uh, Simi said, a book called The Law of Desire, in which I'm interested in thinking about that relationship between, uh, between law and desire or between the state and desire. And when I use that word desire, it's sort of um, an interesting word to use because the law itself actually never uses it. There are no laws of desire or there are no laws that talk about desire. Uh, but I use the word desire really because to me, it refers to an entire gamut of things, including gender, including politics, including culture, including history, including sociology, and all the subjects that really go into making law what it is. And as Rukmini was uh, saying quite wonderfully just now about the dilemma of you know, the mind and the body, uh, the idea of desire, of course, really does build a bridge between what we like to distinguish as the mind on the one hand and the body on the other hand. Um, and so desire, to my mind, is a term that really covers or allows us to expand a conversation that might otherwise be more restricted if we were to only use the terms gender or only use the terms sexuality. But of course, this is also something I'd be happy to talk about more. Um, and I'm interested in a couple of broad framing ideas or broad framing narratives that I'd like to uh, think about today. And the first, perhaps the most fundamental one, is whether the question of desire, with all its concomitant understandings of gender, of sexuality, whether all these questions are private or they're public. We are currently at a moment, sort of politically and uh, historically, where the idea of privacy is, is a big, big deal from WhatsApp's privacy settings uh, to sort of the privacy judgment in, in Puttasami in the, in the Supreme Court. And so we have a lot of talk going on about things being private. You know, now you have talk about, you know, my space and this is, you know, I need room around myself. Um, and we are encouraged to believe always uh, that gender, sexuality, desire are all private matters that not only are they private matters because they belong to us individually, but they're also private matters because they define us in some way, shape or form. And actually not in some way, shape or form, they define us fundamentally. So it seems to be understood as being fundamental for me to say, for instance, that I am a woman or that I am, you know, whatever my sexual orientation might be. Um, and this, so this understanding of desire, gender, sexuality as being private is also seen as something absolutely fundamental and, and indivisible about the self. And so what's interesting to me is that 
when we bring law in to adjudicate a matter that is allegedly so private, what happens then to that notion of privacy? What happens then to that notion of something being so personal and so individualistic and so fundamentally belonging to the domain of the self? What happens to that domain once it is publicly pronounced upon? Once the sort of public sphere of the law and you cannot get any more public than the law, uh, once the public sphere of the law actually interacts with, intersects with the seemingly private sphere of gender. And one of the things I think it's useful for us to think about uh, is that this idea or this contrast of private and public is actually rather spurious because of course uh, we are always told what our gender is or what our gender must be or what our sexuality should be. And even if we think we are choosing our own sexual orientation, uh, that choice has to fit certain parameters that are publicly decided before we are allowed to be a particular sexual orientation. And so this idea of uh, gender or sexuality or desire being private is, I would like to suggest from the very outset, something that is absolutely bogus and an idea that has been impressed upon us, to my mind, in order to keep us quiet or to fill us with an idea of shame uh, and not talk about these things publicly and not talk about these ideas of sexuality and desire and gender in a way that actually takes up public space and owns the public sphere. And so this very notion of privacy, I am rather skeptical about, and perhaps most so in relation to gender, the body, desire and sexuality, because in those realms, it seems to me not only have they never been private because they have always been publicly sanctioned and publicly dictated, but also that are asking us to keep them private is also asking us to keep them apolitical when they are arguably, as we will see a little bit today, the most politicized uh, versions of ourselves that we live in the world. So that becomes sort of one of the largest framing questions that I want to think about. Is this relationship between private and public, uh, between the role that the law plays uh, and the role that desire plays or gender plays or sexuality plays in this relationship between uh, private and public. And of course, uh, one of the ways in which we can think about that is of course the law seems absolute, um, set in stone, uh, while gender, sexuality, desire seem to be much more fluid, seem to be much more sort of up in the air or up for grabs. Whether that is the case or no is something um, for us to discuss. Um, I don't necessarily think it is. I think actually the law is more porous than absolute and that uh, gender is more absolute than porous uh, and that we might want to think about that, uh, that crisscross um, as well. And perhaps the second question that I'd like to throw out there, and really there are only these two questions, broadly speaking, that I'd like to put out there. The second question I'd like to put out there is this question of what is that relationship between law and desire? If they have been in the imagination relegated to different spheres of life, i.e. the public for the law and the private for, uh, for gender or desire, um, then what does that do to the interaction between the two? And one of the questions I'm interested in thinking about is, does law, is the relationship between these two only and always antagonistic? which is to say, is law always trying to control desire? Is law always trying to sort of tell us what desire should or should not be? Or is the law also enabling when it comes to questions of gender, when it comes to questions of, um, of uh, sexuality and of course of desire? So these are sort of two questions, broadly speaking, that I'd like to think about. Uh, the relationship between the private and public in relation to desire and the law and the relationship between the law and desire in terms of whether one enables or disables the other, or whether there's some sort of mixture of the two of them. And broadly speaking, these are the two ideas that I want to think about. Um, and I want to think about them um, briefly in relation to this wonderful, brilliant, absolutely visceral film called The Great Indian Kitchen. If you want to leave this talk right now and go and start watching the film, I think you would have made a very good choice because it is an absolutely important film to watch. Um, it's, it, it streams on a platform called Nistream, which is a platform for Malayalam films and shows. 
uh, you'll have to pay 120 rupees to watch it and never before would 120 rupees have been better spent so i urge you all please if you haven't seen the film as yet to please go watch it it is not a cooking show uh, although you know it is a show perhaps about what's cooking and as you saw in the trailer and i think they actually did a really good job of this in the trailer as you saw in the trailer everyone in the film is really nice they are polite to one another they smile at each other they laugh they seem to be eating delicious food they're cooking delicious food um and in fact one of that that is one of the most savage things about the film that it does so brilliantly i have to sort of you know issue a spoiler alert because i'm afraid i'm going to give away the entire film to you but believe me it's not going to affect your uh, the the effect that the film is going to have on you when you watch it uh, so everyone in the film is nice um no one in the film really has a name other than uh, one of the maids who comes in uh, to clean the house from time to time which is also interesting so it seems to really be a universal story um about uh, about sort of heterosexual men and women and how they are joined together in marriage so um no one has a name it's about this newly married couple and it's very much about their everyday life and how deeply steeped in a uh, patriarchal toxicity that everyday life is even and especially when the people inhabiting that everyday life are, are as i said perfectly decent lovely polite smiling people in fact as you will see when you see the film that makes it all even worse than it would have been at least if there were sort of you know um seething villains frothing at the mouth that would be easier to take because we don't think of ourselves that way but what we see in this film our versions of ourselves and how absolutely hideous and horrible we are and so that is uh, that's the sort of setting of the film and i want to talk about two laws in relation to the film and they're not specific laws necessarily in fact one is just a sort of law um with a small l really more than a big l uh, which is to say a law of society and the second one is not a law at all it's a judgment uh, the shabrimala judgment and i want to think about how both these laws or legal spheres come together in this film that allow us perhaps to shed some light on the two questions with which i started and then we can open this up to discussion and uh, and conversation and questions um so the law of or the laws of marriage as i um as i have listed them here and i've listed all the major uh, laws that govern marriage in our country today uh but i'm not going to be speaking about any of them i can i'd be happy to speak about them later if anyone would like but i'm not speaking about any of these particular laws rather i want to speak about the sort of absolutely insisted upon so insisted upon that it even goes without saying social law of marriage that everyone needs to get married in that trailer you sort of saw in the beginning uh the husband who is a teacher a lecturer in we presume sociology uh is talking about the family as being the fundamental unit of the social and the fundamental unit of society uh but of course the family is anchored by a certain idea of marriage and the idea of marriage this idea of marriage of course is only ever a heterosexual idea um it is an idea that assumes a certain a uh, patriarchal milieu that goes completely without saying um and so not only in terms of rituals around marriage um and not only in terms of you know people changing their names and so on and so forth uh but also of the roles that the husband and the wife are expected to play after marriage uh it is a deeply patriarchal institution and in fact one of the things i would like to sort of insist that i am advocating for today um is actually to for us to rethink the law of marriage uh rethink the idea of marriage as being uh, as being a law and so the first the sort of first book end of this film that i'd like to talk about briefly is the idea that everyone has to get married uh the husband and wife here get married and and um that everything is very predictable and recognizable because it's of course the stuff of millions of marriages around the country as we know them and recognize them with local differences of cuisine and language it pretty much stays the same and of course the roles that each of them inhabits afterwards uh the husband going off to teach in a college and the wife um cooking in the kitchen and cleaning up and uh cleaning the house and it's just all um horrific at the risk of uh, of repeating myself right and so this is the story of marriage in the film 
And the film, without spelling it out, without sort of having a lecture about uh, the patriarchal structure of marriage, shows us that structure very clearly, very unflinchingly, and very unremittingly, and shows us, of course, clearly, and this is why I'm interested in marriage, about shows us marriage as the institution that stands at the intersection of the private and the public, because it's meant to be a private affair between two people, at most between two families, but it really is the most highly adjudicated institution in the country uh, in terms of how many laws are, are devoted to it. And so marriage becomes an interesting test case to think about this relationship between private and public, between the self and the other, uh, between enabling and disabling that I, that I said I wanted to frame this conversation with. So that's the sort of first part of um, first law that I want to talk about in relation to the film, which in which law is seen as utterly oppressive uh, and in which there is absolutely no room to breathe uh, because the laws are literally weighing you down uh, under this weight of marriage. And the second law that I want to talk about uh, in relation to this film, as I said, it's not a law, it's, it's a judgment uh, in 2018. Um, where a, a, a five-member bench, but you know, it was a, it, there was one dissenting judgment. Uh, not surprisingly, surprisingly, I let you decide by the sole uh, woman judge on the on the panel in the Malhotra, and so uh, in, with a four-to-one majority, the judges, the Supreme Court judges, ruled that uh, women of menstruating age, i.e., between ten and fifty years old, would no longer be prevented from entering the shrine of Ayyappan and Shabrimala from the front steps. So currently the way things stand, menstruating age women are not allowed to enter from the front uh, with the understanding that they are unclean and dirty and all those things, of course, that we know about menstruation. Uh, that's the part about the film that I was surprised they left out of the trailer, but maybe they were saving it. For those of you watching the film, I won't give you details, but again, the horrors that surround the woman, the menstruating woman in the film are, um, are really awful. And, and the Shabrimala judgment enters the film almost as a breath of fresh air because the wife who is being kept in confinement because she is having her period, not allowed to pollute anybody else or touch anything else in the kitchen or anywhere else in the house, um, comes across this idea of the, Shab this, the fact of the Shabrimala judgment having been passed She's watching it on her phone. She's reading uh, stories about it on, um, on Facebook. She's even posting, um, linking stories on Facebook about Shabrimala. Um, and uh, that in many ways gives her the strength, that law, that judgment, gives her the strength to really radically change her position within the patriarchal structure of marriage. And so the, the, so sort of the second bookend of the law in this film comes in the form of a judgment that allows a little bit of um, a safety valve allows a certain amount of pressure to be let off and, and the wife to take certain decisions that I won't give away, uh, but that are certainly very much in opposition to the patriarchy of marriage under which she is oppressed. Um, the thing I will say, and I'll be very, very quick because we're already running out of time. Uh, the only thing I will say is that even though this um, judgment was passed in 2018, uh, women of menstruating age are still not allowed to enter Shabrimala. The Supreme Court itself has um, not reneged on its word, but has said to my mind completely disingenuously that this case, that this judgment now has to be referred to a larger bench who will now discuss the issue in relation to multiple religions. Um, and as I said, this is absolutely a travesty, I think, of justice. Uh, but luckily for the wife in the film, she hasn't got to that disingenuous part of the Supreme Court. Uh, ruling. She's stuck with the ruling on Shabrimala, which, as I said, provides her with oxygen. And so just sort of very quickly, by, by way of wrapping up my, my initial remarks, uh, this idea of law, both disabling and enabling the wife in the film, I think is very, very interesting because it's, it's both what oppresses her and allows her to acquire a certain level of agency by the end of the film. Uh, it both describes how women should act um, and also then prescribes how uh, the social should be able to change in relation to how women should act. So it plays, of course, both the role of the hero and the villain, the antagonist and the protagonist. And I'm interested in that. Um, and I'm interested, therefore, in the question of how can we ask law to take ideas of desire, to take ideas of gender and sexuality much, much more seriously 
than they currently do. And just sort of uh, by way of a quick set of suggestions just to throw this out there, both practical and uh, conceptual or intellectual, uh, one of the ideas that I want to throw out there is what would happen if we got rid of marriage. Um, I have written about this uh, extensively as well, uh, which is you know, what, what would happen legally if we did not tie rights to marriage? Uh, would we still be invested in the idea of marriage uh, if, as we have seen, marriage is sort of the locus of the law's oppressiveness uh, in relation to gender. Um, and of course, the other thing is, as the issue of Shabrimala makes very clear, uh, that the issue of considering women as inferior is very much tied to the issue of a certain kind of caste hierarchy, which considers purity and pollution as belonging to upper and lower caste respectively, uh, and to men and women respectively. And so uh, women at that intersection of being both lower class and lower caste, or lower gender and lower caste, stand at that nexus where the law seemingly cannot even touch them to set them free. And, and that is a deeply problematic idea uh, that this film actually brings into real relief in ways that are uh, shockingly wonderful. Um, and just sort of, you know, to end with this idea of what's cooking, another law that, that uh, the Supreme Court has been talking about recently is actually to institute a salary for uh, women at home, because arguably the work they do is enormous, as you will see in, in this film as well. Um, and really to think about this intersection and what, what it would mean for our judges and lawmakers to think about this intersection of caste, of gender, religion, desire, um, and uh, you know, community, culture in, in a broader sense, because right now there really seems to be very, very little idea of that. And I just wanted to end with that idea of women can't wait because I was uh, being interviewed by a PhD student on the Shabrimala issue. And he asked me a surprising question. And he said, um, do you think there could have been other ways to tackle the Shabrimala question? And I, and I was genuinely puzzled. I said, what would these other ways have been? And he said, well, a lot of people say uh, women should just wait for a little bit and we can do this slowly. Uh, and I said, you know, it's been so many centuries already. Uh, how much longer should we wait? And so that idea of sort of, you know, softly, softly and gently is, I think, a deeply problematic idea, especially when you have something on the stove, as we all know or should know, you can't actually wait. When it's done, it's done. Um, and so I'm going to sort of stop here with my initial remarks and welcome an opening up of the conversation and comments and questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nathvi. I don't know whether it's my role to speak now, but um, Simi, would you like to say something? Uh, well, it was a very passionate lecture and uh, I just wanted Madam to continue. Uh, but anyways, uh, ma'am, if you would like to come in uh, and perhaps maybe invite the discussants uh, for their remarks. Yeah, I will invite the discussants I don't want to intervene in what was really an exciting talk, which opened up so many avenues for all of us, you know, and we would all have liked Madhvi to continue. But let me just say two things. One is, I just saw the last sentence uh, and your explanation of it, which is, women can't wait. And it struck me that I was, I'm just reading this book I don't know if you can see the title, ah. <laughs> Why We Can't Wait by Martin Luther King. And I thought, how strange that I'm reading this book from the American Civil Rights Movement. Uh, movement and uh, uh, it has as its title, Why We Can't Wait. And that's the last sentence. And yes. actually I'm writing something, I'm doing a book and um, I connected this to Raj, Rajbir Kaur, who is the sister of Nodeep Kaur, who was recently put in jail. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and again, that was the intersection of the law and what a person was doing or acting out with her body. And um, she says very clearly that when you see, um, when you see patterns of oppression, we must remind ourselves that we, women, and people who feel themselves at the receiving end of oppression, cannot wait. 
-hmm. I want to tell everybody, she said, and the speech was in Hindi, but the word wait was in English. And so with Martin Luther King and Rajvi Kaur and Nabiu, I think we have come to a moment for, to explain to ourselves why, or why we can't wait moment and what implications that has for gender, law, and also for oppression and inequality. And one more anecdote, which I cannot resist, which is to do with, I was reviewing once, um, Ramu Gandhi, Ramchandra Gandhi, who was Gandhi's uh, grandson, I think. And uh, we, we, we had a good friendship. And I was reviewing a book of his, which was called Sita's Kitchen. And he said to me, Rukmini, just you'll find it. Go just go to the bookshop. And I went to the bookshop and I looked high and low for this book called Sita's Kitchen, which was about Ayodhya and that judgment, and the Ayodhya judgment. And I couldn't find it. And it did turn out to be in the cookery section. So, so if you like your great Indian kitchen, uh, that book was also immediately connected. The word kitchen went into the culinary arts and for women. So people were not surprised that I was asking for it, but they didn't expect it to be, I, a woman, was asking for it, but that they didn't expect it to be in um, sort of in any philosophy section yes. or politics section. So I think that the boundaries that you're talking about actually play out in real life. And uh, there's both the question of why we can't wait, which is a political question, which you ended your talk with, and um, the um, notion of uh, the, the, these, uh, the notion of kitchen being a place where you, which is not a non, it's a non-neutral space, brings out many of these very invisible, small time, small invisible boundaries that we can't see. And that's where I think films and the arts do help us quite a bit. They force us to question our, our taken for granted uh, and cruel, often cruel, assumptions. So thank you very much for that. Thank I you. would like to invite the discussants, especially, I don't know the order in which we should do this, but perhaps we should have uh, Usha first, and then the young language block discussants, so that we could then open it further up to uh, for reactions. So Usha, if you're there, I can I, I can't actually see you? Yes, I'm very much but, here. Yeah. I'm right okay. here. <laughs> so now that you're here and I'm reassured about this existential question <laughs> of whether you are there, uh, I want to say that can you possibly spend 10 minutes on a very rich talk, but you know, 10, 12 minutes, and then we could open it up to the lawyers, to the young lawyers in the making and see what they think. I wanted to you know, summarize bits, but I don't think I will because I'm very eager to hear how you received the talk and reacted to it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, Usha, before you begin, and Rupini, thank you so much uh, for that wonderful, wonderful response. Um, Simi, I was just uh, thinking about it just in my question of time. I think it would be useful for all of us just to know how much time we have so that because to my mind, we only have about 12 minutes left of the hour, and we have a lot of ground to cover. So how are we going to do this? So can you just please interrupt? Because I asked this question. I said, this is likely to go over. And uh, he's, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Arjun, to whom I spoke, said we can go over uh, 20 minutes or so. So, oh. so I, I just want to reassure you. OK. That, uh, if, you're, if you're available, that is. Yeah. Because it'll be tragic if we go over and then <laughs> you are absent. Well, so no, that's the whole tragic. point to enable a conversation. But yeah, please, let's. Yeah. Let's so he it. said 20 minutes, even half an hour. That's what I understood. Arjun, you're there. Yeah. Please yeah. speak. Yes, ma'am. So what we'll do, we'll just quickly go and I'll uh, request everyone to be crisp and uh, short. And we'll collect all the questions and then come back to uh, Madhu, ma'am, to respond to them. 
Uh, yes. You can select some of them. Okay, yes. Usha, ma'am, over to you. Before that, we have to have the discussions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. So uh, I will I will not take ten minutes uh, because uh, I don't. Uh, I mean, uh, there is a lot to say. I think from uh, what I've heard from Professor Nair and uh, Professor Menon. Uh, both the introduction and the talk were rich in ideas. So uh, there is actually a lot to say, which will go way past 10 minutes, but I don't want to take 10 minutes because I really would like to hear the young lawyers and what they think about the law and uh, women, uh, because I am not thinking in terms of the law and women as much as uh, I got sort of... Um, stuck by this one sentence uh, that Professor Menon used, which is law is more porous than absolute and gender is more absolute than porous. And I was like, oh, I need to ask her to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, and uh, what, what does she mean by uh, law being porous, whereas gender is more absolute? Uh, because that seemed like a very new kind of uh, uh, thought, uh, considering that uh, we, uh, I mean, to begin with, when I was told about this talk and law in my kitchen, I was wondering what is the law in one's kitchen? And uh, uh, what does one mean by law in the kitchen? Uh, does one mean gender roles? Does one mean gender based work division in households? And uh, um, what is what is the law there? Uh, and uh, uh, why is it that uh, uh, when we are talking about uh, cookbooks, as uh, uh, both of you had started talking about, we think of women? And why is it that we inevitably think that all women can cook and do cook? And, uh, um, and why is it that women feel the need to prove that they can cook? I have myself found, my, uh, found uh, myself in positions where uh, uh, I am trying to prove to people that I can cook. <laughs> and I don't, I don't even understand why I do that because uh, uh, I can't say that, you know, I find cooking recreational activity or anything of that sort. Uh, I mean, I, I cook for, I cook to eat just as uh, I suppose uh, everybody does. So, uh, but this uh, coupling of gender, uh, one's gender with one's abilities to do work and uh, uh, these sorts of expectations of what are the kinds of things that one is likely to do when uh, one is of a particular uh, gender. These are the sorts of uh, tangles that I keep finding myself tangled in quite often. And, uh, uh, and that actually makes me want to believe that there is, there is a fluidity in, uh, uh, in gender identities, or there is a possibility of fluidity in gender identities. And therefore, there is a necessi necessity of porosity in gender identities. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, there, are, there are these multiple moments in uh, Indian literary and cultural traditions when one comes across uh, these sorts of uh, uh, moving between uh, these uh, reasonably porous boundaries, to my mind at least, of, uh, 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 of gender identities. Uh, right. I mean, uh, uh, a concept that uh, uh, we were discussing, Professor Nair and I had uh, uh, discussed uh, way back in 2010, uh, was that of uh, uh, the Virangana, on which I uh, wrote about for her uh, book, uh, the Indian Keywords Project that she had done. Uh, there is Keywords for India, this book that she has uh, edited along with Professor Peter de Souza. And... Uh, uh, in 2010, uh, this was in the conceptual stage or, or some sort of a conceptual stage. And we were discussing Indian keywords very, uh, in a very excited and enthusiastic manner. And uh, uh, one of the words that came up was Virangana from my having mentioned Jhansi Kirani. Uh, and the reason I mentioned Jhansi Kirani is because of that popular uh, uh, 
poem that all of us read as school children in India. Bundele har bolo ke muh humne suni kahani thi khub ladi mardani wo to chhapi wali aa gayi. And uh, uh, that was uh, that was a woman, right? A woman who had uh, taken on a male social position uh, to fight a law uh, that was uh, opposing uh, an accepted Indian cultural law. Right, because uh, the idea that if you have adopted a child, it is your child, and therefore uh, the child can inherit your property, was an accepted Indian cultural law. Now uh, the British were opposing it with uh, this law of accession, and uh, uh, they were saying that you know we cannot uh, uh, allow for this. A biological child will be considered a child, your child, where uh, to inherit your property, whereas an adopted child would not, right? So here was a woman who had failed within single quotation marks in her role, in her social and cultural role of producing an heir, and she was fighting for her right to be the mother of the next king. Right, and to do this, she has used her training uh, in warfare, which was a training that was reserved for men, and she goes into battlefield in uh, feminine garb. So she's wearing feminine clothes and feminine jewelry, and uh, uh, her depiction is that of uh, a queen, uh, but she is on a horse. And that is how the Indian birangana is uh, typically depict, depicted, right? So here is a case of blurring of uh, gender boundaries, right? And uh, similarly, there are instances of these gendering of blood, uh, gender boundaries from the other direction in bhakti and Sufi poetry. And, and that to me is an astonishing treasure trove of uh, 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 you know the complexity of uh, uh, gender identities and desire. So uh, uh, I mean, are these people then uh, uh, breaking the law? Uh, what is happening? Uh, and uh, uh, the the Sabrimala judgment has always been has remained a puzzle to me. So I would like the lawyers to probably talk about it a little bit more, because uh, uh, the the shocking aspect for the Sabrimala judgment to me uh, was that uh, uh, it was not the fact that that this one woman judge said uh, uh, disagreed with the bench uh, and said that women should not be allowed. Um, I, I, I don't want to uh, speculate on her behalf, uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the reception of the judgment by women, uh, by believing temple going women has remained a puzzle to me. Mm. Why is it that women who have, uh, who are believers, who pray, who uh, uh, worship Ayapan, uh, um, resisting a judgment that uh, allows for them to go into the Ayapan temple uh, is, is something that I cannot understand. Uh, so uh, I, I had really hoped that uh, Professor Menon would talk a little bit more about it. Uh, so if I may, uh, I would like to leave that as my question to you. <laughs> and uh, with that, I think I will uh, hand over to uh, Dr. Simi and Dr. Arjun. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Usha, ma'am. Now we quickly go to Akanksha from the Language Rights Block and then Redna. Akanksha, over to you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, sir. First of all, uh, Prerna, Riddhi, and I, we are so thrilled right now <laughs> that we were, you know, invited as discussions for discussions for this, um, this uh, conversation. But we are, all of us feel so inspired to see such accomplished women sitting right in front of us because uh, we are we all of us we really believe that 
and also coming from patriarchal backgrounds again we really always keep looking for you know women to look up to and when we are personally conversing with uh, a, such accomplished and inspiring women like you all we feel really really happy and as of now personally i'm actually contemplating my uh, career choices in future as a lawyer and it's just wonderful it was really wonderful listening to all of you so first of all i would uh, like to res- like to add on a bit to what usha ma'am was saying about gender role right so so recently i was sitting with my uncle and aunt and this advertisement was coming on the television it was about the, the mdh masale ad- ad- advertisement and for that matter most of the advertisements where the kitchen is involved right and we see how in most of these advertisements we see the women in the kitchen women in the kitchen so i just remarked ki maybe that that maybe from now on they should bring in more uh, husbands into the kitchen so that there is a change in the thought process in in the families right so my uncle remarked he was like but wh- what is the need who is the queen of the kitchen who is the ruler of the kitchen so i i was like just because you put the label of queen or ruler does not make it more respectable we have to bring a change in the thought process and i just feel that as young as a you know students law students and actually coming across such notions such biased notions in our families it is, it should be our uh, uh, it should be our duty to sort of bring in ideas and conversations which actually and it should start from the family level it should start from uh, our own relatives because most of the times we see such kind of notions coming from our very close relatives and we should uh, bring such ideas such feminist ideas into conversation so that there is a change in how they feel and then secondly about the sabri mala judgment so we were, i was going once once i was going through the kerala high court's judgment and i was actually uh baffled i mean they they assigned a legal entity to lord ayappa and uh, after that they were like the lord ayappa was a um, uh, brahmanical and also he he would not allow he would not like it if women are menstruating women are allowed into the temple and the fact that women sided that judgment i just feel that this uh, misogyny and this patriarchy has been internalized so much that women in a way forget their self respect and uh, they in a way they do not understand right they are not able to go beyond that and maybe think for themselves that you know they may have a life of their own which is beyond their family which is beyond their roles in the kitchen or uh, in just keeping their family relations intact second uh, responding to madhvi ma'am so first of all what whatever you said about marriage the institution of marriage which it actually struck me and i suddenly started thinking about recent things which even our supreme our, the chief justice our honorable chief justice has said right so recently there was a rape case where uh, the chief justice asked the accused will you marry the girl right so what is this concept of marriage is it a safe zone which has been created for ad- administrative efficiency um, i mean is it a safe zone for uh, for continuation of these patriarchal uh, rules or these patriarchal notions rights right what are what are these rights of men which are being you know uh, be, being given a safe space through marriage and uh, secondly i had one question which i wanted to ask ma'am so in our legal methods course we were uh, made to read a reading by carl steichen so in that he had uh, it, it it was written about it was it was written how critical legal scholars have uh, questioned the whole concept of public and private right uh, because because they feel that the whole concept of public uh, private Uh, zone comes into picture to justify the intervention of law in private zones but at the same time they talk about how important and practical this whole privacy the zone of privacy is but at the same time to for example we take even the homosexuality law right the the uh, amendment so to avail the benefit or even to avail our rights we have to come out of the 
of our private zones we have to come out of the closet right Pri- pri- private zone is like a metaphor for the closet so we have to come out of that in order to avail our rights in the public zone so this discrepancy is something which really confuses me and i would really like to hear what ma'am thinks about it as in uh, why why is law like this <laughs> i mean that is like my basic question and uh, another thing about how law is inherently patriarchal in nature i mean even all these marriage laws right first of all there is always there is only husband and wife there is no husband and husband there is no wife and wife and it's not going to change for a long time because i remember reading an article where eminent eminent lawyers they are trying to get come they are trying to get um take take this uh, law of marriage to uh, question to court so there were articles about how uh you know to protect the institution of marriage and to protect and to for for continuance of progeny husband and wife is required and all these laws are made by men right all these laws that what is women representation even in marriages even in marriages and even in laws which concern women how much exactly how much representation is are women actually being given so even the origin of law is patriarchal in nature so that that was all i had to say but i would really love to hear what ma'am has to say on the public and private divide thank you prerna and rithik please try to be brief if you ask so many question how will ma'am answer so please be brief yes uh for at the outset ma'am it was an ex- act like it was a very insightful and interesting speech and i learned a lot and i look forward to watching the great indian kitchen um uh with regards to like my questions i'll keep it brief uh firstly the point as usha ma'am pointed out the sentence that law is more porous than absolute also struck me because what we're taught in law school is essentially so we're taught the law of marriage in the subject called family law where we're basically just taught the technicalities of law that this is hindu law this is muslim law this is how much property you give uh this is it's it's a very technical approach it's a very positivist approach however i have i've had the opportunity to take this course called critical family law this semester where we're being taught to question the idea of family in family law which a normal course doesn't allow us to do so what law is so when they tell us that they're teaching us family law they delve into the technicalities without allowing us to explore the very idea of family itself and the very idea of marriage itself which is why i believe that this discussion on i mean i think and th- this narrative is what allows the center to say that um you know that homosexual marriages are against indian ethos because you've never allowed us to question the idea of marriage itself and we're studying that that would be our profession one day so i feel like this whole discussion is is extremely pertinent today especially with the responses that we've received from like the judiciary and the center in the recent past and uh, secondly uh, even within like these um, communities these lgbtq communities i uh, had the opportunity to attend a few talks so a lot of people from the lgbtq community argue that um lgbtq marriage is the their most important concern but as you mentioned in your talk there is an intersection within these communities where um say dalit lgbtq those people who identify as dalit lgbtq uh, people or uh, persons or um adivasi lgbtq persons uh their concerns are different their concerns their primary concerns at the stage are not marriage at all it's um its dignity it's they they are treated mistreated they are um i've read a couple of cases from tamil nadu where um people from the transgender community have been murdered have been this these sexual offenses there's no response from the state or the judiciary on this so many within the lgbtq community would argue that no that is a priority so i think i mean i, I mean there's just a, it's a very vast field but i think that your talk has definitely helped me understand a lot of these things and i i do believe that this discussion and movies such as the great indian kitchen will take this discussion forward so thank you thank you thank you ridhi yes big big yeah i'll keep it brief good evening everyone uh, i'd firstly like to thank impact and for the research institute for giving us uh, inviting us to this talk um ma'am so when you talked about law in general uh, we have also read that law's claim of being superior and its aim to um 
to be the truth of everything and the, it responds to things because of its internal reasoning and it un, uh, ends up ignoring a lot of underlying issues in social life itself and this is like there is a norm that is created for participation and if the person does not fit in that norm it is uh, understood that person is the problem but it is not it is the norm that is the problem so in this context i actually connected this to one of the aspect of gender itself where the state intervenes and that is uh, gender based violence so while there are attempts to protect women from violence whether it be mental physical or even emotional abuse um especially like in private life uh, or family life there are there are so many implementation gaps in laws and the guidelines that ministry of health for example has come out with and they still are stigmatized they are still uh, considered to be the problem when it comes Uh, they are raped or they are abused and further i also think that the term gender itself is so blurred because in these laws uh, it's so women centric that the people from the lgbtq plus community are not recognized itself while violence against them is also should be considered gender based violence because even women in homosexual relations can uh, suffer abuse and they also need protection so i would like to uh, kind of ask what your opinions are on this madhvi ma'am so uh, that's about it thank you thank, thank you, you thank you Anshula, over to you. Anshula is assistant director at Tempre. Please be brief. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Menon, for a very intro- uh, intriguing and uh, thought-provoking talk. And my question is along the lines of what has sort of already been brought up in the discussion. Uh, so, of course, the family unit, so to say, is replete with uh, sexism and gender roles, which includes unpaid care work by the women. But then further, there's also abuse and oppression, um, emotionally, physically, financially, even. And the cycle of abuse uh, allows dependence of the women on other family members to continue. continue which is exacerbated by the culture of silence that we have and even at the larger level the state or the law is abusive and oppressive in that sense uh, with the laws that you have mentioned or even in other ways uh, when it comes to a lack of social welfare for women looking to break free or the general paternalism in many of our policies and legal judgments so essentially my my question is would you say that it's the culture of silence in the fundamental level of families that contributes to silence in addressing the oppression and interference by the law and the state or is it the other way around yeah thank you thank you anshula sakshi sakshi is joining us from jnu she is an mphil candidate at jnu also researcher at mphil sakshi please be brief yeah uh thank you ma'am for your uh, question uh, for the amazing talk i have two questions and i'm going to rush through them so that they're quick the first one is that um i wanted to look at the question in what has recently come not recently but there has been a lot of work about monetizing care work and it recently came into the indian political sphere and i wanted to know that a lot of scholars have intervened specifically when it comes to monetizing care work that this would you know relegate women to the private sphere within the patriarchal family thereby continuing oppression oppression with an illusion of agency so can we really consider this to be a solution when it comes to having a salary for women for household work and my second question was uh, located in this very interesting piece that i read by shrimati uh, basu which is about the trouble with marriage and i think she spoke about the similar interaction of how marriage is this uh, marriage as an institution is and family as an institution is this place which is between the public and the private and she tries to locate this through trials which happen in with respect to family laws in calcutta and she uh, in the book there's this one very interesting thing and in which i think the book doesn't really bring about and there's no really question about this that there is this oxymoronic con- uh, you know condition which comes about when it comes to trials in our country which results in shaming of women and the protection of male honor which in itself creates a gendered category of who const- constitutes to be an ideal indian woman and this gendered category of the ideal woman is something which is not only propagated through our laws but also benefits only a particular section and a very particular idea and very privileged understanding of who a woman is supposed to be so i think these are two Thank just you. two very quick questions thank you sakshi chavi over to you chavi is a researcher at impri and also a student bachelor student at sanjeevers mumbai chavi thank you sir uh, madhvi ma'am thank you so much for your talk uh, my question is very short so when it comes to the sabrimala issue there are we all know that there are people who contend that uh, certain temples in india do not permit entry to men at all so how do you what do you say to such people how do you answer such people what are your thoughts on that yeah that's it thank you right thank you so ma'am we have collected 
uh, more of the question which has come on the Q and A and chat box. Ritika, I'll just uh, 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 read them out to you very briefly, and then you can respond. Will that be okay? Sure, and I think it'll just be one concluding statement, and then we yes. will have to end. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Funny, ma'am, to just reflect on something. Ritika, over to you. Yeah, ma'am, there's some questions. So one person, Pranjal Singh, is saying, uh, "Karnataka ke mandri sex for favor ke vibad pe apna istifa de di hai." ये तो एक उदाहरण है ऐसी कितनी सारी घटनाएं हर घंटे होती हैं दिस इज अ पावर एट वर्क फॉर इंश्योरिंग मेल डोमिनेशन ओवर अदर्स तो व्हाट कैन बी डन सेन एंड देयर इज अनदर अनोनिमस अटेंडी हु सेज कि आफ्टर वाचिंग द ट्रेलर दैट फादर इन लॉ इज ईटिंग एट द टेबल टॉपलेस अशेम्ड मेन कैन डू बट वुमेन कांट देन देयर इज अनदर क्वेश्चन what it is the hypocrisy like one temple is saying women can't enter the temple in the menstruating age and there's some there's one tem temple in assam which celebrates this like they celebrate menstruation then um, another question is i think gentleman is a misnomer being gentle is considered a trait of women so why take this trait however prejudiced from women which they rightly deserve is an overhaul of entire linguistic needed then question of power and veerta is anal analogous to men had these been associated with women would men want to be brave and powerful so these are some of the questions which have come in the q and a box thank you ritika thank you to all my wonderful discussants uh, you people are are just fantastic I loved the care with which you had listened, the insightfulness with which you framed your remarks. So I'd really like to thank each one of you very much for your for your interventions and your questions. I'm very grateful for them, uh, and also, of course, for the questions that Ritika uh, just read out. Um, I will be. I mean, I won't answer questions individually. That will take up much too much time. So I'm just going to sort of broadly address some of the concerns and and thoughts that I heard recurring through uh, many of the discussions. and uh, just as an example and i think this was uh, what osha had brought up about the porousness of the law uh, what has always fascinated me is that the law that um, ascribes to itself absoluteness and this is specifically in the indian judicial system that ascribes to itself absoluteness can be uh, interpreted and remember that's always the verbal like the verb associated with the law is interpretation and depending on which bench you get of judges the same absolute law can be interpreted absolutely in the opposite direction and that's what i meant about the porousness of the law which actually is quite scary so say unlike the us uh, judicial system where the supreme court sits as an entire bench on all cases that come before it so they're always the same people who listen to every case here it depends on the bench it depends on who's assigned to the bench you know there's a lot of political activity or accusations about uh, you know assignments on the roster which judges get assigned to certain cases precisely because the law is not absolute and so i think that's one of the things i would like to point to very very clearly that the law shrouds itself in such an atmosphere of uh, regality that you know it shrouds the law uh, and in such a sort of mystical religious air so you know the judges the male judges are called your lordships to uh, in order to submit a petition to the court it's called a prayer uh, the sort of affecting the glory of the court the majesty of the court i mean it's really quite sickening to see the way in which the law ascribes to itself a position that it actually does not occupy precisely because its activity is interpreted or is about interpretation and so the idea becomes what happens if we start thinking about the law as um, one of the law students said critically rather than uh, as believers and we have to do that in order to think about the law as necessarily being more porous both for good and for better for both for better and for worse uh, which unfortunately to my mind does not exist in relation to gender uh, and i would say if arjun were on the screen uh, just to sort of take a look around at every one of these boxes and tell tell me what you see all the women look alike and the one man will look different precisely because the law of gender is unforgiving in most ways in the way in which we live in the world 
So the example of Rani of Jhansi or of the Sufi and Bhakti poets about whom I've written extensively um, is uh, you're absolutely right that they are a treasure trove of, um, of examples that we can and should repeatedly point to, to think about um, the non-fixity of, um, and the non-fixability of gender roles. But just looking around at the screen in front of us or at the world around us um, shows us unfortunately that the, that the law of gender is fairly unforgiving and quite unremitting and doesn't really matter which bench you appear before. Uh, it's going to be the same law, no matter what. And so this was really to take seriously um, the present conditions in which we live and not to underestimate that. Um, and to my mind, of course, it's also a sort of interesting role reversal because we think of the one as absolute and the other as gender. Um, but I actually don't have much sympathy with the term gender fluidity because I don't think it's fluid at all uh, in any way, uh, shape or form. It should be, it can be, it has been. Uh, but it, it really is not in, in, in uh, terms of lived reality, um, which, of course, you know, as the story of the MDH Masala uh, ad makes very clear, uh, is, is exactly the milieu in which we're steeped, the idea that men will not enter the kitchen. Um, I, of course, am one of those uh, crazy women who does not know how to cook, do, do, do not cook, um, and never will. But as, uh, again, Usha said very clearly, one has to actually justify that, or one has to explain that. Uh, whereas if Arjun were not to cook, sorry, Arjun, you're the only man here, so I'm using you as an example. If Arjun were not to cook, of course, no one would bother asking him because, of course, that's not what men do. Um, and I think this film really brings that out really, really clearly. Just sort of quickly to, uh, to um, gloss over some of the other questions that came up um, about how uh, paying women for housework will keep them within the house. And certainly that is a possible trap into which women can fall. But to my mind, and um, I think this is borne out actually by a lot of studies, to my mind, the minute you give women a salary, uh, it's a completely different realm in which, into which they enter. And arguably, and this is an argument again that I make, um, the trouble that people have with prostitution is not that women are having sex with multiple men, it's that women are getting an income of their own that they are not getting from their husbands or fathers or sons. Um, and it is the prostitutes' financial independence, the sex workers' financial independence that actually sticks in the throat of the law or sticks in the throat of a certain kind of patriarchal paternalism. So I think paying housemakers, um, we don't know yet what that will do. So I think uh, sort of saying in advance that it's going to keep them stuck to the private sphere, I think it's sort of jumping the gun a little bit. And so let's try it and see what happens. I actually think it might be quite radical for those who want, uh, for those who want that. Um, and then I think there were a couple of questions about uh, marriage and about um, homosexuality and, and things like that. Um, as I said briefly, all too briefly in my remarks, uh, I stand opposed to the institution of marriage uh, for whoever and whatever sexual orientation. And um, I, a lot of lawyer friends of mine are the ones who are at the forefront of the fight for gay marriage. Uh, and you know we disagree on that. Um, and a lot of people think gay marriage is the key to a certain kind of legal and social equality. Uh, to my mind, uh, no one should be allowed to get married. Uh, and that to me is the kind of equality I would like, because as I said before, again, all too briefly, I don't think we should try rights to marriage. Of course, everyone should have the rights that are currently associated with marriage, but they should not be associated with marriage and should be given to everyone irrespective of what they might or who they might have sex with. Um, and that brings us right back uh, to, to square one, uh, which is the intersection of the private and the public. As you know, many of the posters in the uh, days leading up to the 377 judgment uh, always were about, you know, we do not want the law in our bedroom. And that is of course a very effective slogan, uh, but it forgets the fact that the law is always already in our bedroom uh, and we cannot ever get rid of it. And so really having a realistic view of what the law does and what it can't do uh, is something that I hope all of us will be able to take forward conversationally, culturally, uh, and frankly, listening to all my discussions and, and your, your brilliance really gives me hope that this conversation uh, is something, as Rukmini said, whose time has come. So thank you again very much for engaging so deeply uh, with my thoughts and comments.
Right. So let me quickly go to Rukmini ma'am for her comments and then uh, we can have a vote of thanks. Rukmini ma'am, over to you. Your yeah. comment. Yes. Well, I have to say that after this discussion and this back and forth, I feel that all the questions that were in my mind have been raised in many different ways. And so this should be a continuing discussion rather than a single talk and a continuing andolan, as it were. So I don't really think that we should uh, try to bound this very exciting discussion. I want just to say that while listening to you, it struck me that one of the because I'm a linguist, that one of the phrases you hear from the judges every day is, and, and from the public, the politicians, is the phrase which is in fact embedded in the Ramayana, which is the Lakshman Rekha. And I have all, and every, you know, it comes up practically every day in public discourse. And I have always thought that the Lakshman Rekha, and have written that Lakshman Rekha should be redefined as a Sita Rekha. And why I think it should be redefined as a Sita Rekha, and that would be a metaphor to begin, is that the agentive role of Sita in that is so enormous in that legend. She is the one who crosses the boundary. She is the one who sends Ram chasing after the golden deer. She is the one who takes responsibility for her actions and she is the moving agent. But it is her desire for the golden, desire for the golden deer, which causes the movement of Ram inside the village. It is not Lakshman drawing the Rekha, which is patriarchal, but her uh, decision to cross it. That is so critical and important in that legend. And why does she cross it? Because she wants to give, she has empathy. She wants to give arms to a poor person. So there in those kinds of metaphors, I think that even redesigning the language in which we talk, in continuing the conversations which we have. Now we have several practical issues which have been raised wonderfully by the speakers. Which, is, which are the issues of paid labor, which are the issues of um, pri the private pub public boundary and how it can be tackled by, uh, I mean, what should be the laws regarding homosexuality, is gender written in stone and so on. But beyond those practical issues, it is imperative for us to speak up, to talk and walk together and remember that none of these metaphors, which are patriarchal metaphors, are unreclaimable. They can be reclaimed. And I would say, even by the simple act of reading, thinking of a Sita Rekha, which is not a Rekha at all, we might be, you know, all our women, I want to say, are called things like Rekha and Akriti and Shraddha and Anjali, every single virtue resides in the women. You know, Chavi, I see these names, Sakshi, Witness, across the board. And I notice that what is happening here is the labeling of women, but not an agentive, uh, 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 a seeding of, um, uh, uh, seeding of agency to women, C-E-D-I-I-N-G, I mean. And so I think in some ways, just having this talk, which is a lecture, I think has been enabling. And I, I th just think we should continue and think of all those Sita Rekas we could go. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. So let me just quickly propose a vote of thanks. Or Simi, are you there? Yes, please do so. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. It was what a thought provoking, informative, interactive and uh, intriguing session. It was amazing. Thank you, Professor Madhvi Menon for leading us through your presentation into 
you know exchange of uh, uh, amazing views and thoughts across age groups that came up uh, this evening uh, thank you professor rukmini bhayanair for chairing the session and also uh, so effectively adding to the richness of the uh, of the discussion our discussants uh, dr usha uh, akanksha prerna and uh, riddhi also sakshi uh, ishika chavi ritika anshula and the soul mail voice uh, dr arjun thank you so much for enriching joining us this evening and taking it uh, taking the whole uh, deliberation to a next level uh, it was really really uh, informative thank you and i hope that uh, this opens up uh, uh, the space for more and more conversations like this and uh, hope that we'll be able to interact further uh, on a similar subject that can uh, raise more and more issues into the uh, limelight thank you so much and wish you a very very good evening thank All you right. thank you so thank much thank you i i have noted many economics related question i'll ask later <laughs> thank you thank you yes, because thank in you. economics we we say free trade animal spirit there is also a lot of you know desire in our economics thing we do and as ma'am su suggested that housewife giving also during this pandemic we tried that pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana but however we only give 500 500 500 1500 to women janthan account so the quality also remains concern uh, in our but anyhow thank you so much and we all uh, are so grateful to learn from you sure. have a nice day thank, thank you so much thank you rukmini ma'am thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you everyone bye okay so uh, mafi uh, can i uh, i need to talk to you about something else can we talk uh, do you shall i share number? the phone number please yeah, do. i will do that can you just give me your phone number and mm -hmm. maybe uh, my phone number with mathi and the other way around. i will do that i'll do that thank you thank you thank you thank you so much bye bye